Oh, well, hi, everybody. This is our second uh, webinar with uh, Attila Capitani. Thank you for joining us again, Attila. And this week, you're going to talk about edible Australian succulents, and you're promising a controversial webinar. So I, I think I can't wait. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Well, um, before I get too far into it, I'll recap on my presentation last week, which was about bottle trees and boabs, because in that I did touch on the edible aspects of these plants as well. So edible Australian plants I covered slightly in last week's talk. So if you want to review that, you can see that on the HMA website uh, and look for those uh, aspects. But uh, this topic today is more so about smaller ground cover succulent plants that are more recognizable. And uh, there is a problem in discussing the topic, but before I go into the complexities of it, uh, I just want to at this stage acknowledge in particular my wife, Michelle. Now that text there is not intended so much for you to read it, but for me to emphasize something. Michelle, my wife, took many of the pictures you will see and I've left the best till last. So, um, you know, and also uh, another important, very important point, this is only really for me to read out for myself, is a few seemingly troubling and confusing ideas I hope to distill into something cohesive by the end. In particular, I've got a problem with the word succulents because it means lots of different things to different people. And also the word succulents, which means a lot of different things to different people. You see, you know, uh, those two words are very, very different. Now, uh, let's put Australian succulents, those two words together, because uh, uh, one of the ideas that people have when they think of Australian succulents is I ask them, what do you acknowledge as being native? And they don't think that there's too much out there worth knowing, let alone worth growing. So, you know, what, am I going to try and entertain you for 40 minutes or so on this topic when there's barely anything out there? Now, I reference a book, a famous book, an encyclopedia of succulents. Uh, Gordon Rowley, he is a world authority, a botanist, a world expert on succulent plants of the world. And in this text, a quote from that book, it reads, a map of the world distribution of succulents. Anyway, for instance, in the middle here, it says, Australia is a continent almost without native succulents, just a handful of not particularly fleshy, mostly cosmopolitan weeds. There it is, that section there. That troubles me because that's a historic problem that has affected and influenced Australian society for the last 200 years. There's the word weeds at the end. Weeds, really? Well, let's look at the ones we most well recognise. Um, the genus Caprobrotus, common name for this plant is pig face. Pig face, uh, such a derogatory name, but pig face. And this is how it grows and it's well recognized. There are different species, of course, but pig face. And this is the other most well, the most easily recognized succulent plant we have in our gardens. We recognize it as a weed. If you don't recognize it, its common name is purslane. That's also called pigweed. What a horrible name, pigweed. Uh, anyway, back to that quote, that famous quote, cosmopolitan weeds. Well, if it's called pigweed and it's in our garden as a weed, a pest weed, we're not likely to appreciate it. So it has very low regard in our minds. So anyway, um, I've been studying these plants for so many years, in fact, decades. I'm not talking one, two, three, but more than four decades working with them. And these are all native Carpobrotus, but all the different species and the comparative flowers showing there are distinct differences amongst them when you compare them side by side. In fact, I've been doing so much work over the years, sampling from here and there all across the continent, and I now know which ones have the biggest flowers. I now know which ones are native, which ones are not. I now know which ones have the biggest fruit, the sweetest fruit, the most interesting and delicious fruit. There is a difference, but that's not for now. So back to this famous quote by Gordon Rowley, the effect of botanists like Gordon and botanists around Australia is that we have an overview that these plants are not worthy. Australia is a continent almost without succulents, just a handful of cosmopolitan weeds. Well, what's this then? My goodness. Do I even know what they are? No, I don't. But this is Australia. This is native. 
And this too is native. It's new. It's a new, relatively new species of, oh, at this point, I've just teased you with a couple of lovely things that are not recognizable by most of us. So I'm going to show you a lot more of the goodies, the ones that you will like to see and appreciate in a little while. But I have to start first with recalibrating our thinking because there's a problem I mentioned with the word succulent. What it means is a noun. The word succulent, plural, for the word succulent. And then there's succulents, which is an adjective. It describes something about plants. Now, um, this plant here is a typical succulent, everyone acknowledges, but it has leaves which are full of water. They're turgid. It's highly succulent. I'm using an adjective to describe it. It's got highly succulent leaves. This is after months without rain, additional rain. The leaves shrink and shrivel. It's less succulent than it was before. Now, after a year or so without rain, it's not dead, but it's shriveling. And it's even less succulent than it was before. Then when the rains come back, it rehydrates and plumps up. So the level of succulents could vary within a plant, and it's not always obvious. So the word succulent, noun, plural, the middle, the bottom. The bottom one, word succulents, is the most important. Scientists, botanists, do not like to use the upper words. They like the lower one because it describes something about plants. So... Botanists use the words together, succulent plants. It characterizes an aspect of the plant that is more succulent or not succulent at all. So that's very important. I, now, the one at the front, these are in our garden. These are both succulent plants. This is far more succulent on the lower species, less succulent, but still obviously succulent leaves. Here, a succulent coastal plant with succulent berries or fruit. Uh, there is the same species, and of course, those leaves appear to be highly succulent. There's the same plant with its succulent leaves and succulent fruit. In fact, those fruit are delicious, but it's got the name Enchilina. Now, you might say, is Enchilina a succulent? At times, it can be. This is obviously highly succulent, but that name Enchilina in Latin actually means succulent. So if you look at that word and see it into the internet, you'll find it actually means succulent. So there you are, but it refers mostly to the fruiting aspect of the plant. But these are different Enchilina examples. And it's not always showing highly succulent leaves, but definitely it's got highly succulent fruit. Now the leaves are edible, the fruit are edible. Well, changing the topic, the genus Calendrinia. It's been renamed a few times. There's another name, Periculia, there. So there's going to be some controversy there and that these are going to be renamed again to another genus. But... You can see the obvious plants with the succulent leaves, and they're well recognized. This is a calendrinia. People walk past and say, I didn't see any succulents. Well, I look at the leaves close up, and they're very fleshy, um, somewhat succulent, but I, I don't know if gardeners would recognize that as a succulent at all. But yes, it is botanically a succulent-leaved plant. There it is, the same species, and after good rains, yes, observable succulents, obvious after good rains, but after drying drought months without rain extra, look at the leaves shriveling now a little bit less succulent than was before. After two years without rain, the same species almost shriveled, but not dead. It's waiting for rains to rehydrate. But the aspect of succulents is something of a controversial point here. It's an arbitrary thing as to how succulent a plant is or isn't. This is a calendrinia new to science, dis discovered in recent years, and has a large flower, very large. It's the largest of all the species, the most attractive of all. It's the same species again here, but sometimes it does not show observable succulents in the foliage. Here are two species of calendrinia contrasting uh, uh, one flower. Uh, here we've got two different calendrinias. There are Dozens and dozens and dozens of species, both described and undescribed. Every year or two, new species of calendrinia are being described. Now, the calendrinia on the right has obviously succulent leaves, but not in the roots. The one on the left, the most observable succulents is apparent in the root, highly succulent roots. These are edible. All aspects of calendrinia, both the leaves and the roots, are edible. 
but you can see how two species within the one genus have contrasting obvious succulents here and down here on, you know. Now, those succulent roots are so delicious and full of water and sweetish. Most people don't acknowledge these as being succulents or succulent plants, but those highly succulent roots, you know, this, this is the flower's of that one I just showed you previously. So it looks attractive when flowering. And this is how a lot of these calendrinias look above ground when rehydrated after good rains. So in spring, you might observe them like this. But, you know, calendrinias, some come with big flowers, some with little flowers. There are so many species. And they're such beautiful things, calendrinias. And they're all edible plants. But they're not really appreciated or understood in their full, you know, in terms of being a food source. But calendrinias, I'm just teasing you with some of the diversity in calendrinias. Oh, gosh, so our colours daily in Habitat. There's Michelle on a laptop doing her notes for the day. We're often doing spending half an hour each on the laptop, taking notes about things we've observed or learned. And we spend a lot of time in arid regions, exploring, walking, travelling, asking questions from locals, Indigenous people. And here on this stony plain, she's walking along looking for, and she's found, yes, emu tracks there in the foreground. She's following now. So she's called me over and we follow the emu track because we know that the emu is going to lead us to something important. Of course, they're looking for food or they travel, and by following these track marks, um, you can see a calendrinia here near the foot track print marks, calendrinia here. But what's noticeable here is the emu must have stopped, and he didn't take a bite from here, but he took a bite from here, this calendrinia. And this is the species in question here. This calendrinia often has no leaves, obvious above ground, but the flowers, when open, identify the plant. But you can see the buds. There are lots of buds there. This plant is cryptic. It often disappears from the obvious above ground uh, area and you can walk right past it if you didn't know you wouldn't know but there it is coming into flower and when the flowers do eventually open it's quite a stunning thing but if you didn't have it flowering it almost uh, doesn't exist but interesting underneath the plant there's a water storage organ and that water storage organ is incredibly sweet uh, when uh, bitten into and it's um basically uh, cool in the ground in the desert when it's 40 degrees outside you can touch the ground with the palm of your hand and the ground's hot but if you dig a centimeter down two centimeters three centimeters it gets so much cooler you could actually in the middle of a midday summer sunny day be walking around in the desert and wondering oh how a person could die out here there's no water in sight anywhere but let me tell you there's water everywhere in the desert there's water everywhere if you know where to look for it. Now, you don't need a divining rod and you don't need to be walking around with Perrier mineral water in a bottle by your side. You could actually be looking for plants that have observable water storage organs. And if you know where to look, the indigenous people knew where these plants live and grow. And it's interesting because it's like little water bottles in the ground. They're sweet. So, you know, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. Thank you, emus. Now, Changing the topic for a minute, this is a plant uh, used in some restaurants as a garnish, also pickled. You might well recognize there are different types, and some do change colour, but there's some different species here too. They're not all the same. They generally go under the name Halosarchia or Tectocornia. Most of those in the genus Halosarchia have now been moved to Tectocornia, so I'm just using the genus to represent what I'm talking about here. Uh, they're halophytes, and they're often found in saline soil conditions. Hello, Michelle. And um, this is typically how they grow and how they appear. There are different colours. Some do change colour, but there are indeed uh, a whole range of different species and they have attributes which are worthy of consideration. This is one farmers love because it doesn't require saline soils and can be found in farmland everywhere, but sheep love eating it. So farmers love sharing it with their sheep. It provides the sheep not only nutrients, but also water in the succulent stems and leaves. But um, something to the right, this one here, by the way, the green thing, it's got a name. It's called Halosarchia halosnomoides. Oh, what a mouthful. Oh, anyway, to the right in the back, can you see that? What's that in the back? Can you see in the far right? Well, if that's Halosarchia halosnomoides, 
let me introduce you to Helosarchia bulbosa. It's bigger, better, brighter, more beautiful and more interesting. It's so rare. The government has kept a secret where they found it. They don't really encourage people to go and look at it because it's not widespread through the continent. It's found in only one place, in only a few kilometres of Australian, Western Australian desert region. Anyway, Helosarchia bulbosa, it's very bulbous. And look, it looks like grapes. Oh, are they delicious? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You have to read my book. But anyway, Helosarchia bulbosa, what a name. Now, there's even plants bigger than this. I introduce Tectocornia veracusa. This is being cultivated around the world. In the Middle East, it's being trialled because it's potentially going to, they believe, it may one day rival wheat. But it's able to grow in impoverished soils like no other plant can. There's its name, Tectocornia varicosa. It is an amazing plant. And the indigenous people have been harvesting it for centuries and they still harvest it to this day. It produced, oh, wow, another one. There are so many and they don't require saline conditions. This is one growing in a friend's pot and it's just growing lush there but it just shows that it can be grown it doesn't require difficult saline conditions or desert conditions it can be grown in in, in anyone's uh, glass house or garden now this plant here is very important to indigenous people it's a succulent plant it's often oh, there's this flower small there it is on the lower section that's a dysphyma another genus but they're both succulent plants obviously they're it is the red. It's growing in my garden with another uh, portulaca here. But that's, uh, it's got the name Anacampseros. Anacampseros, if you grow it in cultivation, it's very green and lush. I'm growing them in foam boxes here experimentally. There's two different species. There's one here and there's one in the back here. But these two things called Anacampseros are remarkable because underneath the plant is a tuberous little potato, like a little sweet potatoes, and they taste like sweet potatoes. So... Or in Portulacus. Look at the roots on the right. This is a snapshot of something from a publication on the topic of edible succulent plants. Sweet, nutty, sweet potato like tubers. Oh, now, change of topic for a minute because I get a bit excited. So I'm sorry. It makes forces me to refocus, recalibrate. This is a Portulaca that you all know and grow as a weed. I see people in their vegetable garden pull it out amongst their veggies and throw it over the fence or in the compost. And yet little do they know how significant that plant is as a nutritious... Anyway, this is that plant you call a weed on the right-hand side, Portulaca oleraceae, the botanical name. But on the left, I found this in the desert. It looks kind of the same. But in the next slide, you'll see this one's grown rapidly, this one's small, in the next slide, the plant on the left will be twice the size of the one on the right. So let's see. Oh, sorry, it'll come up in a minute. I'm, I've messed up. Uh, I found some in the desert that have bigger flowers, more interesting leaves. They still all go under the same umbrella title of Portulaca oleraceae. This particular one's been moved to another genus, uh, it's, oh, sorry, another species called Portulaca intraterranea. And it has bigger flowers. But uh, time check. I need to just check how, how how my time's going. Anyone can tell me if I'm it's, roughly? Um, 19 minutes into the um, okay, seminar. Good. No, that's fine. I get carried away and distracted. But, uh, okay, recalibrating for myself. This is in a greengrocer nearby. And uh, not only you can see the name at the bottom there, Portulac, <laughs> that's spelt, that's a horrible spelling of the name. That's not how it's spelt at all. There are so many mistakes to that name, just like our interpretation of value of this plant. So, yes, it's kind of a weed, but it's not cheap there, is it? And yet it's in our, you know, most gardens all around Australia would have it and know it and most gardeners hate it, but little do they know how important it is. There's something that I just can't emphasize. Now, um, Portulaca oleraceae, or purslane, as I call it, it's also well known around the world as purslane. It's found all across the continent. It's found everywhere, and it's considered to be introduced. But I have found traveling into arid regions in this white section, there's this section here where indigenous people have been harvesting the plant even before European uh, 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 Europeans arriving here. And the indigenous people who actually cultivated 
uh, and used, used this plant, found value to the plant that is beyond our understanding to this day. So uh, I showed you before how um, this weed here on the right-hand side is larger than the one on the left. So in the next slide now, it should actually reverse. So that was the larger plant in the beginning, yet the one on the left has grown so much faster. It's overtaken the one on the right. And this is something found in South Australia, and I've been developing it over the years. This is something that goes under a name of Portulaca oleracea Omega Gold. It's called Omega Gold because it actually has something about it that's kind of a yellowish colour. And that yellowish colour, when it continues growing, it gets this bright colour, and it's quite an extraordinary plant because it can grow to a metre and a half across, and yet it's not invasive and weedy like your common garden plant. And also, too, it produces more seed, and but it won't become weedy, which is quite strange. Its flowers don't open. There it is in habitat. And it's not something that comes up by the thousands in the garden. It tends to just stay as a more of a solitary plant. And you can see here a tuberous root as well, which is edible. The leaves are edible. The roots are edible. The seed are edible. And I also found some portulaca that last for years. This one's been growing in a pot in my collection for over five years. So it's not an annual or a weed. It may one day turn out to be a different species. Now, this is one that was found that has a purplish reddish color, and that purplish reddish color continues even in the shade. It always retains a, a, a really strong uh, reddish pigment, and there it is looking rather brown. You might say, oh, how ugly, how horrible, how weedy. There's your weed on the left-hand side, and there's this thing I'm calling Portulaca Omega Red because of the red color. Now, uh, again, there's the common green one we know. Now, if you stress the green one, it turns a little bit red on the edges. But this red one is so red, it's growing side by side. You can see the two plants are very, very different. That's how it looks when it's at its reddest. And this Portulaca Amiga red is so interesting and so fascinating. It's not only featured in my book on the topic, but there's actually some interesting science. Now, I'm talking science. Uh, we'll go close to this paragraph here because zooming in on that section there, it reads as follows. Science researcher Colette from the Charles Sturt University writes, the Australian desert populations showed much higher antioxidant capacity than the common purslane and also increased potential to treat diabetes. Now, this is the tip of the iceberg. This researcher isolated four red compounds. Now, can I just ask you, the audience, if I were to ask the question, what's healthier for you, um, uh, red beetroot or orange carrot? Well, the answer should be red beetroot because of the red color. And if I ask what's better for you, red grapes or green grapes? Well, the answer should be red grapes. What's better for you, red wine or white wine? Well, the answer should be red wine. There's actually chemicals in the red. The association is quite important in that there's something in there that um, is considered much healthier than the other. So anyway, the red, better lanes. Uh, now you'll notice here, um, they were present in all varieties, but much higher concentrations in Omega Red. I also tentatively isolated a new compound I'm calling, so this is new to science. It was most prominent in Omega Gold and also looks to be responsible for increased anti antioxidant properties. Now, um, this scientist researcher is saying it's very exciting. Now, I've got references there. So, so you know, this is not something I'm making up here. So now, uh, besides Omega, Portulaca Omega Red, there's also Portulaca Oleracea Omega Gold. And this is the one I showed you in the presentation. Again, there's another section where the researcher, the same researcher, points out all three have shown antioxidant capacity and the presence of betalanes. Now, that betalane is what I was talking about with regards to the red, which are relatively uncommon colored compounds found in only one order of plants. 
They've recently shown the potential to treat a variety of conditions, including diabetes. Now, um, did you know that Portulaca oleraceae as a plant has among the highest omega-3s of any plant in the world? Now, that is so profound. Omega-3 is considered important, very important health-wise. Now, I'm pointing out and sharing with you a range of attributes from this simple plant that gardeners refer to as a weed. And yet, if this weed in your vegetable garden were to be eaten, it would provide you more health benefits than any plant in your vegetable garden. Now, that is absolutely gobsmackingly, uh, this is cutting edge. This is really important. And yet, We'll pull them out and throw them into our compost and say, oh, that terrible weed. I pull them out and cultivate them and so forth and also eat them and use them. And and, and I find it you know, through history, man has been eating this plant for millennia. And yet in the last 100, 200 years, we've thrown it all to one side, thrown them out as weeds. Gordon Rowley, you've got to, a lot to answer for, let me tell you. Now, on the left, there's a Portulaca Amiga Gold, and to the right in the bag is Portulaca Amiga Red. Now, same plants at the same age, you can see this one's grown massive, this one's small. I've gathered them up because I'm collecting seed and also testing things out. And when you talk about productivity, this plant here is really large. I can only put a small plant into the uh, on the scale, and you can see there it's over two kilo of plant mass for that small plant. The larger plant uh, breached what the scale could manage. So... Now, that's Amiga Red, and I'm gathering seed on a piece of newspaper. And after shaking the plants dry of their seed, I've sieved them out. And I thought to myself, well, that's not bad. I could probably eat that or whatever. But those seed, I consider it really important. Uh, the Indigenous people, that's a lady. You wouldn't believe it. She's actually grinding the seed. And there in the Kulamon, there's seed of Portulaca oleracea. And this is what they've been doing. For millennia, and 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 it's interesting that uh, uh, this uh, activity. I've often wondered how could you ever get gather that much seed? If you ever tried to gather seed of the portulaca, it's so tiny. It's like gunpowder. It's so tiny. Yet I've over the years been experimenting enough to say that I've actually now mastered a way to gather seed in quantity and quickly now uh changing topic for a few moments so uh, this there's three different plants from three different genera growing together in habitat now all three of these plants are called pig face this is called uh the inland pig face this is called uh the uh uh, uh round leafed pig or noon flower and this is called uh sarcosona another version, another type of inland pig face. But all three, so Sarcosona, Carpobrotus, and Dysphyma. Now, um, I'm going to, there's Dysphyma, and there's Sarcosona. There's a Sarcosona there too. I'm going to stay with Sarcosona for a minute because there's a lot of confusion about how to tell the different types of pig face apart. There's Sarcosona again, and it's got its lovely pig flowers. That's typical in habitat in dry arid regions. Sometimes you can tell Sarcosona has these bumps on the leaves when they're young, bumpy leaves, but that's not always obvious. Only when the plant's drought stricken, dry, uh, stressed a little does this express these features. But uh, there's Sarcosona praecox when it's in flower on the right hand, on the left hand side. Now this plant on the left hand side with its pink flowers, that's typical. Sarcosona can only be identified absolutely by its pink flowers. Now, some in the audience might be thinking, well, so what's that plant down there on the right side with the orange flowers? Or oh, that, oh, that, that's poisonous. And it's not native. Now, that's controversial because if these plants were not in flower, would you be able to tell the difference? Well, I certainly couldn't. Really? Now, this is me growing sarcosona in my garden. To the left, there's a there's a pelagonium and there's succulent roots beneath. I eat the roots of that. There's sarcosona. I eat that. Behind that, there's a dysphyma and something else behind. Oh, 
I've been experimenting with different types of pig face or carpobrotus and dysphyma and sarcosona for so many years now. I've really, I really feel I've got the handle on it. But, you know, I'm often perplexed by there are so many experts in Australia, so many experts who are experts on plants, on native plants, on creating uh, bush gardens and bush tucker gardens. Well, I often in my travels, pop in to visit uh, bush tucker gardens that have become very popular. I've put the yellow star on top to cover up the name of the town because I don't want to embarrass anyone because it's rather embarrassing what I'm going to share with you. This bush tucker trail, a lot of money spent, a lot of effort. It's a new development. But walking through into this bush tucker trail, I look at the extensive, expensive signage and it's throughout the garden and it's a new planting. It's only been there for a year or two. I've covered up those yellow markers of mine to um, make it ambiguous so you don't know where I am. But walking around this newly established garden, there's my, hello, Michelle. I see lots of plants planted, but what's at the bottom of these shrubs? Oh, oh my God, it's got orange flowers. I think that's not native. That's poisonous. And that's in an edible bush tucker garden. That's dangerous. Now, here we've got a walkway down to a water pond. And again, more of that plant with your own flowers. Now, I'm not giving you the plant's name, not the genus, nor the species, because that's in the book, my book on the topic, because it's really an important, controversial subject. But people are planting poisonous plants. Poisonous plant. Did you know this plant? If you look, oh look, I'll give you a clue. The name, the genus name is called Malifora. Malifora, uh, Malifora comes from Africa, and it was used over the last hundred or so years in ex scientific experiments to create a poison. The plant is regarded experimentally as something important for creating poisons. So yes. during the the apartheid years, if you research that melophora is with the word pH, so melophora instead of an F, as it sounds, melophora, but it's pH, not F in there. Anyway, uh, I'm walking around the garden, and besides this melophora, I'm giving away my secret. Uh, on the right side, there's a carpobrotus, a pig face, carpobrotus going there. I'm thinking, oh, okay, lovely. Oh, hang on a minute. See those red stems? See those long red stems? Well, that's a very obvious plant. Oh my God, it's not native. Another one where we've got plants in the garden growing that have been utilised from nursery sources or from experts who are growing and selling, but really... No, oh, that's controversial because, anyway, now here's a plant called Tetragonia tetragonoides, warrigal greens. I call it a succulent plant. Well, I don't call it a succulent. I call it a succulent plant. There are times where you can actually go up and touch it and feel it and squeeze it and say, oh, it's rather fleshy, rather succulent, but barely succulent at all, if at all. Uh, Tetragonia tetragonoides. And here it is again. Sometimes it can be bluish. I've got a stem of it alongside this tetragonia. There are numerous tetragonia in Australia, and knowing and telling one apart from the other is not always straightforward. It is in this image. But let me tell you, the one on the back is called tetragonia, tetra, uh, sorry, tetragonia implexicoma. That's the name, implexicoma. And the leaves are fleshier, so more succulent, and sometimes it's highly succulent, showing lots of characteristics that would classify it as a succulent plant. The leaves are very thick. But... Um, uh, Lovely. Oh, it's sometimes drapes, trees and shrubs. And it's not always obviously succulent. It has a one other name called bower spinach because it often grows with bower like effect where it looks like animals are living in there like it's a home for somebody. So bower spinach. But, you know, uh, this tetragonia has highly succulent leaves, also highly succulent fruit. Really nice, delicious, small, not large, but they're very nice, tasty fruit. And they're common, mostly coastal or near coastal plants. And there's one draping in trees. It looks like it's actually part of the tree. All the red things are the fruit hanging and, you know, 
small fruit, but if you actually put a large enough coolum on or newspaper or umbrella and shake the tree, you could fill and have a kilo of fruit in oh, less than a minute. But uh, there's the fruit hanging. Now, this is in my garden. This is an African plant called Aptinia, and I'm using it in contrast to the previous plant with red fruit. This has red flowers, and this introduced plant from Africa is now also widespread in coastal regions. And if it were not in flower, you would not tell the difference, the two species. But here, the Aptenia from Africa has red buds, which appear here again, they appear to be fruit-like in appearance and almost with the same size of the fruit of the native species. This is an exotic species. And when you look at them, the leaf can vary considerably, but they often can grow together, the two plants, side by side along the coastal peninsula here in Mornington in Victoria. And when it's flowering, it's a little bit easier to tell apart, but it's not always picked or sampled and eaten when it's in flower or fruit. Obviously, the fruit, when you compare the two, but, you know, it's funny, uh, people seem to, there are restaurants that have actually gathered plants, coastal plants, supposedly native plants, and they serve them up in restaurants. But I've seen African aptenia accidentally, inadvertently being utilised as the tetragonia. And I'm thinking that's fascinating, just how little information can get you in a lot of trouble. Once you're an expert, you know it all. Well, I used to think that too until I've been in this game now 40 years and I realise the more I know, the more I realise how little I actually do know. Um, there's the Tetragonia implexicoma fruit. There's the Tetragonia uh, tetragonoides. And this is the largest flowering Carpobrotus in the world. Uh. I serve well, now. There's a lot of issues about signage and information that circulates around Australia. I'm near the Grampians at a place where there's Bunzul Shelter and a lot of Indigenous uh, information here. And this sign's put together by experts. And there's lots of information. It's very good information. But at the bottom of this sign, it's a bit weathered, I'm sorry. But at the bottom of the image, there's a wallaby over here. There's a wedge tailed eagle up here. There's a acacia up here. But there's a plant along the bottom which looks like a succulent to me, I go closer, oh, it is a succulent. But hang on a minute. If we're in the Grampians and we're showing Grampians-type flora, uh, why then are they showing a plant that's not native to the area? Oh, hang on a minute. Am I trying to confuse you or upset you? No. Well, in fact, there's a plant growing in the, around the Grampians and around this sign called the Inland Pig Face. That's should be technically Carpobrotus modestus. And modestus has a modest flower and modest growth habit. This plant here is a dysphyma. It's a different genus. Oh, but hang on. The experts, uh, uh, quote, the experts who put this sign together, put in a plant, that's close enough, that'll do, it looks pretty, but that does not represent the indigenous food plants of the area. Quite on the contrary, this is upsetting. Anyway, I'll leave on that topic. You know, I've got an issue within myself. If I'm researching plants, researching anything, nowadays, I don't know why, I'm 65, but still, I, I go to the internet and I can almost find all the answers to all my questions and then I move on. I'm satisfied with what I've researched. Well, you know, it troubles me because oftentimes it leaves me short of the truth, short of the right answers. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, at 65, I have a history where my involvement with books, I've got all the books on all the plants, all the native plants. I've got all the books. This is just some of the books that I take with me in the field. And you can see the word arid there and wildflower. Well, you know, I look in these books and succulent plants are barely there. They're hardly covered. If anything, only a few of the weedy ones are negligible here and there. They touch on them and then they move on. It's not their priority. It's not their interest. Well, you know, I go back to Gordon Rowley and his quote, for instance, Australia is a continent almost without native succulents, just a handful of fleshy, mostly weeds. 
I think it's ironic. You know, I've actually been now, after decades of searching, I've actually found that there's not this handful of weeds. I've actually found incredible plants, incredible sites, and incredible things that really, I can't tell you how beautiful these things are. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of native plants that are highly succulent. They're significant to all the animals and insects and the indigenous people. They're significant. And yet, Culturally, for the last 200 years, we've turned our back on this horizon where plants could be explored and discovered that are interesting, beautiful, but useful and edible. Yeah. I can't tell you how much uh, it disappoints me to think that the potential of these plants is beyond my wildest dreams. Dorianthus in the back. I utilise this plant and eat this plant. What part do I utilise and eat the succulent part. Where is it succulent? You on in the leaves? No, but that's not for today. In the foreground, obviously, you can see this is in my garden with Michelle. There's Caprobrotus, and there's a bullbine. Bullbines are also regarded as edible. But you, oh, that's in our garden. These are images in our garden. Everything in the image you see there is native and edible. And this is in our garden. There's hello, Michelle. You'll see a sturge desert pit. That's not a I'm sorry. But there's, there's tetragonias. There's all sorts of things in this image you can see here. Pots and trays and foam boxes experimenting all the time. This is also in our garden. There's calendrinia. So not only can we have them aesthetically positioned throughout our garden, all of these things are edible. Um, so we walk around the garden throughout the given seasons and when people visit and we pick and harvest. Uh, there's Michelle gathering very carefully. They're tiny fruit. They're very small. But uh, there are ways of gathering hundreds in seconds using a box and shaking the bush above them. But uh, when you have these, what do you do with them? I mean, do you eat them raw? Do you cook them? What could you do with these sorts of things? Well, we have them as garnish. We have them mm, that's in a soft drink, but you can also, with gin, I've tried it with gin, and when dropping in to the gin and soda, the colour of the liquid I roll starts to take on, the fruit seems to uh, dye the fruit, and I thought, I'm going to leave some of the fruit overnight in a glass and see what, hello, Michelle, and Charlie, hello. Uh, now, left overnight in a glass of water, in the morning, it was like this, I thought, oh, goodness, do you know, the alcoholic industry, if they were to understand, appreciate, and utilize some of these things, there's potential here, incredible potential, but no one's really going down this road. And I thought to myself, oh, here's an example. We had a barbecue, some friends over, and we were sitting in the garden, and we had lots of fruit out, and, and with the fruit and vegetables and including some native things, the visitors didn't know what to do with them. Oh, that's novel, they say and comment and perhaps try and nibble a little bit to show some, uh, like, like respect to us. But really, they don't know what to do with these things. Michelle then gets, that's her hand, she dips a piece of raw broccoli and dips it into a yogurt over here and then dips it into these red uh, ankylina berries and covers them, smothers them, and then she continues to then eat it. A lot of the guests noticed what Michelle did and said, oh, that's a novel idea. I'll try that. Suddenly it opens the door for experimentation and they try the same and they found it ever so pleasurable. Oh, and that big fruit of the carpobrotus, look at that for size. Oh, and doing things with it. I mean, we don't just talk about it. We do. We eat and utilise, and this is from our book. Uh, and and often Michelle's experimenting. There's ankylina fruit, yellow ones, pink ones, red ones, and with a salad and 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 even the leaves. We've got portulaca oleracea there and other bits and pieces. Uh, so we're always, ah, oh, I conclude now because I can go on for another hour and show you more, more plans, more stories, more interest, more controversy. But no, I'm going to stop short now and just emphasise that uh, my struggles with trying to promote and educate people with the diversity, the beauty and the usefulness of these plants, I've been compelled to produce this Publication. It's not a large publication, as they four, but uh, in it, 
it's got pretty much the bulk of what I've shared with you to this point, but there is more. There is so, so much more. This is the beginning. Now, I also juice my own seed, harvest and sell the seeds and seed kit with book and booklets on topics. Last week, I spoke about bottle trees and boabs. I've uh, visited a retail outlet that had some spare copies of my publication. I have now available three copies left of the bottle tree and boab with me. So if anyone's interested, and I've also got the edible succulent book still available. And oh, there's Michelle cheering me. There's a restaurant and it's serving not just as a cosmetic decoration, not just as a garnish, Australian native plants are mostly used as an accessory to the meal, an accessory or a complement. But really, I've got here the leaf of a succulent plant. We've got succulent vegetables on the right and left. We've got succulent meats, native meats, native vegetables. Everything here is native. There's potential that has not hardly been explored to its you know, so uh, now, slightly different topic. My next presentation, for perhaps for next year, Australian succulents, the unfriendly ones. These are the most significant plants at protecting Australian native fauna. These plants that you're looking at are highly succulent, but they can protect themselves from grazing animals, from rabbits from cows and sheep and goats. These plants can protect themselves. And behind these plants hide our last remaining populations of bilbies, our last remaining populations of the night parrot. So some of Australia's rarest plant, uh, ra rarest animals are sheltered in these plants. And you can see obviously that uh, insects and uh uh, creatures that associate with succulent plants are not insignificant. And in arid regions, succulent plants are often the most significant plants at providing food and water to people and to animals. But um, just, uh, oh, no, I won't show you, but I eat, this is typical. We peel them back and there's white roots and it's like, it can be sweet and crisp like an apple. This is a brachychitin repestris root. And after cutting off and eating the roots, we plant them back in the vegetable garden and the top grows another one again. Dorianthes, you mentioned, I showed you a picture, but I didn't show you which part you can eat. The obvious succulent roots and highly succulent stem is edible. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm more or less closing off on this at the moment. So uh, I want to see if there's any questions. So where are we at? Can we uh, go I back can, to main? Yep, I can main. ask you some questions that have come up. Uh, Attila, thank you very, very much for that. That was that was really fascinating. Everyone can say thank you. Um, Helen wanted to know uh, right at the very beginning when you showed the, um, I think it might have been the purslane, but it was a root, a very a small plant with a very, very big root underneath it and you were talking about the emus walking along and eating bits of it oh, yes. um, she wondered what our animals actually do forage on the roots of some of these native succulents uh well uh to expand on that a little bit i can but i i only know so much so uh my information and resources are limited in my in that my experiences are i do know that emus <laughs> And emu chicks depend upon calendrinia that when emu chicks are born, the first six weeks of survival through much of arid Australia is totally dependent, totally dependent upon consumption of calendrinia. So the first six, this is well recorded in literature, the first six weeks of survival for emus in arid or dry regions of the continent, there's not regular rainfall. So moisture for tiny birds that are delicate and fragile is totally dependent upon access to calendrinia for providing both moisture and nutrients. Uh, now, 
Um, animals can often, whether they can, uh, they know a plant has uh, uh, moisture in the ground. Um, um, if you travel to arid regions, you'll often find there are animals, including rabbits now, that dig, uh, pigs that dig, and the roots of plants are highly sought after, especially if they're succulent. But I have nothing on emus actually digging uh, these plants out, but rather it could be assumed that they, in loose, sandy or stony soils, so that they could pull a plant and have its roots come out. Mm. Uh, that That's obvious, but I have no evidence of that at all. Okay. And um, I, I, Kim said, are they all edible? Are there any that we shouldn't eat? But I think, I, I guess, a broader question would be, you were talking a lot about, say, the purslane and things. Is it, is it important to prepare it in a certain way? I mean, I know um, that some uh, of yeah, these... Yeah, okay. There, there is, in, in the raw state, uh, Portulaca oleraceae, if eaten in high concentrations, it has oxalic acids, yeah. and so has the tetragonia, uh, tetragonoides, warrigal greens, so have even a lot of, you know, even rhubarb is edible, but it's also poisonous. One part's edible, the stem, but the leaf is poisonous. So, uh, you know, it's it's fair for me to say, even though a lot of the plants that I've shared with you uh, are basically edible and won't kill you, nibbling on plants here and there in your travels cannot do you harm. But uh, as you well know, cycads are edible, their fruit are edible, and yet most white people that have tried to eat it die from it. Oh. It needs to be prepared. Joke, I'll joke now. It needs to be prepared under a full moon and picked by virgins. That sounds ridiculous. The process for prepared now, this is factual. The process for preparing cycad fruit so that they're safe to eat is very convoluted and a dangerous thing to try and attempt for the inexperienced. Now, yeah. with the plants I shared with you, you can walk around in the desert and pick them and nibble them without any problem. But some of our earliest explorers have reported consuming large volumes to uh, uh, deal with their thirst or their hunger, and it causes oh. stomach cramps, discomfort to pain. It can, so you can overdo it with anything. Yep. Um, if anyone's got a question, just unmute yourself and ask. That would be a good thing. While well, I have a quick look in the in the messages here, um, a lot of people saying thank you. Thank you. Uh, that that yeah. Here's a question. Who's that? Someone speaking up? No. Um, I just noticed Dan has said Dan Austin has said he'd like to be in touch with you about. Um, experimenting with some of these uh, Australian succulents, um, Attila, so that will be of interest. Well, see, I'm... you know, it's interesting. I, I get, I, I actually get hundreds and hundreds of requests, questions, and, and, and often it bogs me down no end. Having produced this book called Edible Succulent Plants, the aim of it is to introduce people to the idea to start experimenting, to get excited and try and experiment. But for me to be able to answer all the questions on 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 the preparation and the cooking, I've just this is a beginning for me. This is not conclusive. This is not the end. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I want to excite people okay. about doing their own research. Yes, yes, I think that's a good idea. Any more questions coming up? Two new messages. Wait a minute. Let me have a look. Um, oh, where are your books available? So Attila's oh. books are available online. Go on, Attila. Yeah, if you if you look up my name, Attila Capitani, it's the best way. It'll lead you to our website. So if you look up Attila Capitani and if you get our website, it's got quite obvious and there's a side menu, uh, books, book sales. You can order there. There's also an eBay store where we've got it available. So um, do have a look. Uh, there's a range of uh, publications. Uh, this particular one, uh, yeah, it's 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 the popular one to buy at the moment. This is this has only been out a year or so. I was invited um, um, as a result uh, to a conference called the Bush Tucker Conference of Australia and uh, in Brisbane held this year. And it was incredible to hear and listen and see all the speakers and what they have to offer. But uh, uh, I was sharing uh, the topic that deals with the majority of the, 
drier, arid regions of the continent. The, the Australian continent, 80% of it almost is uh, considered arid or semi-arid, 80%. And that's a vast area of Australia that is not being utilised for all the plants that are available as a food source for our bush tucker industry. So, you know, there's incredible potential there. Mm. But, yeah, website, yeah, so follow my name, Attila Capitani. It'll lead you straight to our website quite easily and left menu, and there's books and magazines uh, section there. Yeah. Well, a couple of people have posted up saying they're definitely going to do that straight away. Um, and everyone's saying thank you, Attila. So I think unless there's any other questions, we'd better wrap it up. It's almost um, the end of the hour. So uh, we've got, people have got to get back to work, but I'm sure you do as well, Attila. So, again, thank you very, very much. Um, and we will put this uh, webinar on our website for more people to, to view or to review later if there was something that you missed. So oh, I got you. something. If I got something real quick, there was a, there's a question nobody has asked me yet, but the, I've given the same presentation in the last few weeks to several organisations, including yep. Australian Native Plant Society. And one of the most important questions asked was, the Bush Tucker Garden, that's organised by council and government and botanical experts, the Bush Tucker Garden I shared with you, yep. where they have a poisonous plant. The question asked me was, have you? cold them have you fixed it what have you done about that problem well the answer is this i tried to tell the gardeners about the problem and they look at me like and who are you are you an expert <laughs> then i have to go home and spend the next three weeks sending my uh, credentials and details and literature and do you know i spend more time repairing problems trying to educate and help and i realize uh it's actually a very difficult challenging uphill battle because it has to go through right. council and then eventually someone writes back to me and says oh you're right <laughs> but that took you know if i was making a living out of my repair work if i could actually make a living out of it uh i'd be rich just on the repair work i do in this field mm. actually i had that as a question to ask you so i am glad to hear that after perseverance You've saved people from being poisoned by that orange plant. So thank you for that. <laughs> and also, the, I'm in the, I'm in the, just last week, I was, uh, uh, sorry, a few weeks ago, I was in uh, the Halls Gap, Grampians uh, National Park, and there's a botanical gardens in Halls Gap. And I was giving a presentation there on exactly this topic. And the botanical gardens there have a plant titled Inland Pig Face. And mm -hmm. they actually have a non Australian pig face growing in there instead. Yes. Again, yes. I spent the following week after that uh, following it up and, and 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 they finally agreed, yes, you're right. But, you know, they at first they don't want to hear my, uh, they don't want to hear that they've made a mistake of such magnitude. Of course. It's a, people's usual reaction, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> Attila, thank you yeah. very much and uh, keep up the good work is all I can say. And, uh, thank you. Oh, look, I, I love it. Thank yep. you, Jennifer. You've inspired us all. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you next year, I reckon, when you uh -huh. get that new prickly one out. <laughs> thank you. Oh, it's out. It's out. It's out. All right. Well, we'll put, we'll put that up on our website as well. So thank you very much. And we'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye -bye Thanks, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Attila. Thank you.